doing all right? All right. So glad that you're here today, and I hope that you had a great week and weekend as well. A few things before we jump into the text this morning. First off, tomorrow is Veterans Day, and I know that we have several um, veterans in our uh, church across all of our locations, and I just want to take a moment to thank those of you that have served uh, here in our country to help provide the freedoms we enjoy, including this very freedom uh, to worship. And so if you are a veteran uh, of our armed forces, I would ask that you would stand, please, if you are a veteran today here with us. Go ahead and stand. Say yes. <clears throat> Thank you all so much <clears throat> for uh, your service to provide, again, the freedoms that we uh, get to uh, celebrate today for those that have served and those that are serving. We are thankful um, that we get to do uh, this very thing today. Also, uh, as, as Nick mentioned earlier, this past weekend, um, we hosted what was called the Collective Conference. It's why the platform looks a little bit different. They um, put forth some effort to have a, a special setup for the weekend, and I want to commend our worship and creative production teams for uh, having the vision. Yeah, y'all clap for them. Having the vision and um, just the conviction to want to be a blessing. A lot of effort went into it, a lot of volunteers, our staff um, poured a lot of energy into it, and I'm thankful that, as Nick said, eight, 18 churches and then individuals, almost 200 people came uh, to just talk about uh, how, how do we worship God and how do we serve God with all of our gifts and all of our creativity, and so I'm thankful for uh, the collective conference this weekend and all those that were uh, able to attend. Uh, and then, as also Nick mentioned, uh, the, the announcement video was a little off. So um, last week here in McAllen, I shared that today we were going to be lo at long last wrapping up Hebrews, that after 40 weeks, we were going to land the plane, and we're not. <laughs> so it's week 41. I think you've got one more in you. So um, looking at the text this past week, what was going to happen is it was too much left for one sermon. And uh, originally, I thought, well, you know, we're going to just kind of preach up to this point, um, and we'll call it good. It's been a great 40 weeks, 41 weeks, and uh, we've covered Hebrews, and so we're just, there's going to be about five, six verses we're just not going to be able to get to. But, you know, that's not too bad in the grand scheme of things. And then as I began to think about that and pray about it and began to prepare for the sermon for this week, I thought, I, I just can't do that. 41 weeks, I can't, I can't leave five verses when I'm so close. Landing gear is out. We are nearing the runway, but we will uh, extend the series one more week. And so make sure you're back next week as we probably for real wrap up the book of Hebrews. <laughs> we'll see what happens. That being said, we have been planning a brief series, just so you know, uh, I'll share with you and you can be praying and getting your heart ready. Uh, we had planned starting next week to start a brief series called I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. I Have Decided uh, Life on Surrender. And we wanted to take a few weeks and really encourage people that have yet to trust the Lord with baptism. Again, baptism doesn't provide you salvation. It doesn't guarantee you entrance into heaven. Baptism is a display that you have that relationship with Jesus already. Uh, but it's a very important act. It's an act of obedience and, and surrender and uh, saying that if you've made that decision to trust Jesus or if maybe if you, do, if you do in the next few weeks, we would love to celebrate with as many baptisms as possible. Uh, but that is getting pushed. And so uh, we will still gladly baptize everyone who wants to get baptized next week as an act of obedience. But we will be wrapping up Jesus is Better um, and then transitioning into 
um, the, the, what will most likely become one week of, of uh, I Have Decided, and then we'll jump into our, our Christmas celebration. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and give you all a little bit of a teaser. This year, w- through the month of December, we're going to be talking about what is an upside-down Christmas. Um, in, in our society, and I'm a Christmas person, right? But in our society where um, it's so hectic and it's so stressful and finances get so overextended and our hearts get so overstressed, what would it mean to slow down a little bit and to turn Christmas upside down and remember what Christmas is really all about? And so we're going to take a few weeks uh, leading up to our annual Christmas Eve service um, to prepare our hearts for the birth of our Savior. That being said, why don't you go ahead and grab your Bible and open up to Hebrews chapter 13 today. Hebrews chapter 13 for our most likely second to last sermon of Jesus is better. All these weeks, 41 weeks including today, if I am correct, uh, outside of a few weeks that we hit pause around Easter, all this time we've been walking through the book of Hebrews and realizing that the overarching theme of the book is what we would call the supremacy of Jesus, which is really fancy talk to say we've been talking about the fact that Jesus is better. And we've talked about some really critical areas. He's, he is a better Savior, right? He's the only Savior, but in a world that offers phony ones, he's a better one. He, he, he's a better Savior. He's a better high priest. He, he is the last high priest. He completed his sacrifice on the cross. He ascended to heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father. His work is done. Now he prays on our behalf. He's a better high priest. He is a better advocate on our behalf. He's a better intercessor. He, he's a, a better sustainer. Uh, we've looked at heroes of the faith that believe Jesus is better, was better in their lives and looked at how that should impact us today. In these last few weeks, as we've been nearing the end of the book of Hebrews, we've been looking at how because Jesus is better, that should have a practical effect on our lives. See, Jesus is better shouldn't just be a saying that we hold to for, you know, 10 months. It shouldn't just be a sermon graphic. Jesus is better should be the fabric of our lives. If Jesus is better, it shapes the things we do. It shapes who we are. It shapes the joy that we live with. And here today in Hebrews chapter 13, specifically verses 7 through 19, we're going to look at how Jesus is better. It's much more than a saying. It it should be a sustaining way of life. How, How is Jesus is better? How is Jesus being better? Not just something we say, but actually a sustaining way of life. How, how do we day in and day out, knowing that we'll miss the mark, knowing that we'll fall on our face, knowing that we'll have those moments, but how do we strive day in and day out, not just to say it, but to believe it and live it, that Jesus is truly better? And we're going to see a few things in the text this morning that I think help us when we remember these things and apply them They help us live a life that demonstrates that we truly believe this, right? Let let us not be a church. Let us not be a people that get together and sing and say how much Jesus is better. But when it comes down to it, we're just not willing to apply it. We're just not willing to actually live out the betterness of Jesus in our lives. And so let's take a look at the text today and see what it says to us. In Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse 7, it says this, Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teaching, for it is good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food regulations, since those who observe them have not benefited. We have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace, for we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Verse 16, do not, uh, don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. Obey your leaders and submit to them since they watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not greet with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience wanting to 
conduct ourselves honorably in everything. And I urge you all the more to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I pray uh, that as we have gathered, you would open our hearts and minds. And God, I pray today that as we look at your word, that you would encourage our hearts. God, I pray today that hope would be received, um, that it would be restored. God, I pray today for situations uh, where some may be feeling despair, um, that, God, you would remind them of your goodness. God, I pray today for situations that, that cause um, angst inside of us related to relationships or finances or health or other situations, that, God, you would remind us that you're better than all those things. God, I pray today you would speak clearly to our hearts. I pray you would encourage us. God, I pray today that as we look at your words, there is someone here that has yet to trust Jesus. If there is someone that has yet to receive the gift of eternal life that only comes through that personal relationship, God, I pray today that you would call them by name. You would speak to their hearts, and I pray that today would be the day of salvation. God, I pray today that the time we spend in your word glorifies your name, and I pray that it blesses your church. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so a lot of stuff going on here in this text that I want to try to cover today. I'm going to try to put all of that into three main points, if you will, three main actions. I want to be kind of practical. Three main actions that help us live, help us sustain a life that believes Jesus is better. And looking at the beginning of this passage, the first thing that I want to say is that if we believe Jesus is better and we want to live like Jesus is better, we need to practice remembering. We need to practice remember. We need to be a people who remember. Again, verse 7, there's it, there it is. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. Imitate their faith. And then Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The first action we see in the text is a call to remember. The truth is in the life that we live, we, we, we all face situations that easily discourage us, right? I mean, sometimes we come to church and it's a great service and it's like, you know, the, 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 neither thought about you personally when she picked all the songs. It's just every, it's all your favorite songs that day, you know, and, and man, all the jokes were funny and, and, and every, everyone, um, you know, that shook your hand wasn't sick. And, you know, I mean, it was just, it was just like a perfect, perfect day and you can leave heart filled, but it doesn't, right? It doesn't take much sometimes if we're not careful to get out of this place or, or you're having your own time of personal devotion, but, but, but to be feeling the closeness, the nearness of Jesus, to be walking on high, if you will, and just to have something happen in life in a day and just kind of punch you in the gut and, and, and we get discouraged. And so we get discouraged and in our discouragement, we, we start to question, whether we say it or not, is Jesus better? Because this is a pretty tough situation I'm in. I'm going through a pretty real struggle right now. I know that Jesus is better. And a lot of times, if we're honest, it's not that we doubt that Jesus is going to get us to heaven, right? I mean, Jesus is going to get me to heaven. I'm just not fully convinced he's going to get me through the day. Until I can actually get there, I'm going to toil, and which is partly true. We will struggle sometimes in this life, but we think that we've got to just endure it until we get there. And, and the author tells us, look, Jesus is better. And if you want to live that out day in and day out, if you want to sustain a lifestyle of Jesus being better, then you need to remember Remember that earlier in the letter, and, and Hebrews is a letter, it's not written chapter and verse. No one writes letters that way. If you're single, guys, and you're writing love notes, don't do chapter and verse, okay? Not a great approach. But in the letter, it was just a little bit earlier in the letter that the author had listed all of these, all of these heroes of faith. And so here, towards the end, he, he's saying, look, we need to remember, remember spiritual leaders, remember those heroes that we've talked about, remember those that have gone before you, some that have already finished the race of faith, and when you think about them, seek to imitate their faith. Paul, Paul says that, he says, follow me as I follow Christ, right? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Christ is the goal, but God has blessed us with heroes of the faith, men and women that have gone before us or that may be further down the road from us that are walking alongside of us, and we can remember them in our struggles. It's the beauty of community, right? The, the beauty of community is that most likely whenever we face something, there is someone around us that has faced something at least similar, right? I don't know about you. Sometimes I go through the dark night, so I get stuck in a pit, and, and the biggest struggle is like no one knows you know, what I'm going through. But it's just not true right? 
And so we remember both those that have gone before us, and we have a list right here. We remember those that have gone before us, and we remember their faith, and then we are encouraged to remember Jesus is better. When we have you know, the, the best day possible, we know Jesus is better. When we go through the struggles, we know that other people have walked this road faithfully. We recall their lives, and we remember Jesus is better. But not just that. Verse 8 says that even more than just remembering spiritual heroes or spiritual leaders, we, we more than that, we remember Jesus. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Remembering, remembering heroes that have gone before us, that have finished their race, or remembering those uh, among us that are, again, maybe a little further down the road than us, it's beneficial in our lives of sustaining and proclaiming Jesus is better. But even more so than that, remembering Jesus. It sounds really elementary, but we struggle with it. It sounds basic, but we need to, we need to remind our, we need to fix our hearts, right, to, to sing his praise. We, we need to remember if Jesus is better, we need to actually remember Jesus. The funny thing about people that have gone before us, heroes of the faith, is that we can't actually talk to them. We can read about them, we can study about them, we can talk about them, but we can't actually talk to them, but Jesus is this ever present source of help in times of trouble. Amen? He's this always available counselor. He, he's always listening. He's always ready. And if we want to live a life, sustain a life of Jesus being better, we've got to actually remember Jesus. The weight of verse 8, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? We are a changing people. Now, that, that's difficult. It's not easy. It's not necessarily uh, exclusively bad, but it's just a fact. We, we are a changing people. We age, right? Come on. Oh, not me. Look, that cream only does so much, all right? We all age, right? We age, we, 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 we change physically, right? We, we grow. I mean, I'm just like being real big. We, we, we go through change. Our personalities change. Some of us over time, our personalities freshen. Some of us, our personalities sour, but whatever, you know. We, we go through changes. And again, it's not exclusively. No one likes it. We've said this. No one likes it, right? No matter what anybody says, we, we like change until we don't like it. We, we like these changes, but don't do these changes. But that being said, while, while change is inevitable and while change is, is, a, is a fact of this life, there's this comfort we have that because our spirits struggle with it, we've been given this promise that Jesus isn't going to do it. He's going to help us through changes, right? But he himself is constant. He's this immutable is what we, we call it theologically. He's this unchanging presence. And when we go through struggles, when we need to recharge our soul and remember how great Jesus is, we have this reality that he has never changed towards us. His love is unwavering. He's never going to leave us. His presence is with us. His favor is upon us. His approval is not based on our merit. Do not believe some type of teaching that says, you know, Jesus is happy when you're doing good, but when you're struggling, he's pretty mad at you. Okay, we, we make decisions sometimes and consequences follow, but the favor of God has been applied to our lives, not because we've done some great work, but because Jesus did. It is impossible for God the Father to be displeased with God the Son. God the Son has applied his life to those that have received him through salvation. Therefore, it is impossible for God the Father to be displeased with me. I may do things counter to his his will for my life, but his favor has been given to me. And one of the best ways I believe to continue to walk like Jesus is better, to continue to walk in obedience is not to beat myself down. I need to acknowledge my sin. I need to confess my sin, but not, not to beat myself down with that, but to remember the kindness of God in my life. It's his kindness that's going to propel me into repentance, and a life of repentance hopefully propels me into obedience as well. But we have this assurance that Jesus is better. Think about just what verse 8 says. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let, let, me, let me just talk about that for a second. Yesterday, Jesus offers up prayers with loud cries and tears to the Father. 
He's the same yesterday, day, forever. Yesterday, Jesus offered up prayers with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Remember Jesus in the garden? He offered up those prayers, but he stayed faithful because he said, not my will, but yours be done. Today, Jesus is a high priest before the Father who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Check the yesterday, Jesus, in the garden, praying, sweat drops of blood, let this cup pass from me. But he stays faithful so that today, Jesus, today, Jesus is no longer sweat drops of blood in the garden. Today, Jesus is ascended high priest, conquering king, victorious Savior. And yesterday, Jesus prays in the garden. Today, Jesus intercedes on our behalf, and he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses because, as Paul says to the church in Philippi, he emptied himself and took on the form of a man. And then forever, Jesus, right? Yesterday, Jesus. Today, Jesus. And forever, Jesus always lives to make intercession for you and I. No one understands. Jesus does. And he, he unchanging, in an unchanging way, always lives to make intercession on our behalf when we belong to him. Jesus is better. It is not just a slogan or a cliche. It is a way of life, and it is not the easiest way of life to always choose, but we remind ourselves of who Jesus is. We remind ourselves of those that have walked faithfully before us, and we encourage our hearts that no matter what we're facing, Jesus is better, and in the end, that truth forever reigns supreme. We look to those that have gone before, but more importantly, we look to Jesus, and then verses 9 through 14, Another action to sustain a life of Jesus being better. We don't just remember, but we understand. Understanding. Right? Understanding. Again, in verse 9, it says this. Don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for the heart. Um, to be established by grace and not by food regulations. We know that that, that at the time as they were experiencing persecution, there was also some teaching going on, that there was some dietary restrictions that needed to be followed uh, in order for for a life of godliness. We have uh, an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. That is through verse 13. It is apparent here that these believers, again, not only were facing persecution, which is a pretty tough deal, but also they were, they were dealing with some, some teaching that was inaccurate, uh, specifically teaching, again, about food practices, and the author is encouraging to stay away from them. But, but what's being painted in these verses is a few things that we need to understand about Jesus. See, the problem with the, the food restrictions is that the nourishment of the soul, not just the body, doesn't come through some legalistic approach to believing Jesus is better. Nourishment of the soul is Jesus himself. Understand this, the things we do for Jesus isn't what makes Jesus better. Jesus is what makes Jesus better. That's pretty deep stuff, right? (laughs) Jesus is what makes Jesus better. We have to understand that with Christ comes spiritual nourishment. He is the keeper and lover of our souls. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. It is not some, some dietary restriction, some list of do's and don'ts. The feast of Jesus being better is the grace of God applied to our lives. Amen. And please don't let that just be some statement that we hear today. But no matter where you are on the spectrum, understand that the nourishment for your soul, if you've received Jesus years ago, but somehow you're discouraged today, you know what you need? The grace of God remembered and applied to your life. If you feel so far from God that you can't be helped, you're just hoping somehow to make the end not as bad as it could be. You have a promise that if you respond to Jesus in faith, you have life everlasting. And not just that, but you have life to the fullest. The answer is the grace of God applied to our lives. Think of gravity for a second, right? I've never been to Niagara Falls. I'm sure some of you have, and don't raise your hand because then I'll be jealous and I'll have to deal with that throughout the day and confess it later, but never been to Niagara Falls, but I, I've, I've seen pictures, seen videos. It looks amazing. Hopefully one day I can, I can see it with my own eyes, but if you think about Niagara Falls, uh, to get a little nerdy for a second, what's happening? Gravity is pulling the water down, right? 
If there was no gravity, then it would just kind of float around. But 9.8 meters per second squared, right? Hey, I remember that one. The acceleration of gravity. It is falling over the edge, plummeting down towards the rocks, along with some silly people in barrels. I don't encourage that. Um, but gravity pulls the waters over the, over the falls. And there at the bottom, a river forms, right? All that water collects, and that river forms, and, and then gravity pulls that river, right? It still flows to the lowest point. Gravity's pulling down. And as the river that, that's created from the falls flows to the lowest point, what happens? Growth. In those lowest points, things begin to grow, right? Vegetation begins to sprout up because of the sustaining nature of the waters that have come from the, stay with me, come from the falls that gravity has pulled down to pool and collect in those low-lying areas. Well, beloved, just to kind of apply that illustration, grace is gravity-fed as well. That Jesus, even though he was God himself, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But Jesus came down, right? That, that's, that's Christmas. See, he, he, it is never that we go up. It's only until Jesus comes down that we have the ability to then by his grace and through the power of the Spirit to get up. We, we, are, we are stuck on the ground without it. He comes down. And he lives the life and he dies the death, and he takes our place. Payment is made, and then he goes back up, right? Je Jesus dies, and he rises again, and he ascends to heaven, and then he sends to us the Holy Spirit. And it is through the work of Jesus on the cross that, the, the, and this is graphic, but, but the, the blood of Jesus that is spilled, it doesn't just, that, that day that we celebrated, it didn't just spill from the body of Jesus and pool around the ground of Calvary. The blood of Jesus, when it was spilled, it fell to the ground, but it didn't just fall there. It fell to the souls of men and women who would call upon the name of Jesus so that they might be saved. And it's an understanding that we need to have. It is what Scripture is filled with, that we would set our minds on things above, that we would put on the mind of Christ. Our nourishment, our sustaining life is the grace of Jesus. But also here in these verses, uh, the, the author begins to talk about uh, the Old Testament practice of the high priest, uh, the, 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 the priestly order taking in the sacrifice. And, and, and we've talked about that some. I don't have time to get into a lot of detail, so I hope I can kind of fill in the gaps if you're not familiar, real familiar with the story. But, but, but what would happen in the Old Testament is there would be um, the high priest would offer a, full, a, a, a few sacrifices. There'd be a sacrifice uh, of a bull for, for his own sins, right? But, but then there would be this land that would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. And the, the text is telling us that, that that blood would be taken into this place in the tabernacle, in the mobile church of the Old Testament called the Holy of Holies, where one person could go one time a year. And the blood would be taken in. You're like, man, this is graphic. But it was this picture that sin comes, sin requires a price, a payment. And that blood would be, would be poured over this altar, but again, it gets graphic. And then the bodies of these animals that were sacrificed, they would be taken outside of, it says, the camp, the, the, the collection of the people, if you will, right? Outside the city. They, it wasn't a city yet, but they would go outside the camp, and those bodies would be burned. It was a little bit different. Sometimes with sacrifice, there'd be a sacrifice, but the actual carcass left over would be able to be eaten. There'd be nourishment. But these, stay, stay with me now, these these bodies of these animals, that there would be no accessibility to them. The priest would slaughter them, would spill the blood on the altar, this, this, this symbolic picture of sins being covered, and then those carcasses, those bodies would go outside the camp and they would be burned up. There's no accessibility to them. And what we have to understand, the weight, I believe, of what's being communicated, that if we're going to le live like Jesus is better, we need to remember, uh, you know, who, who he is, but we need to understand what he's done for us, that he is the food for our souls, but we also need to understand that he is accessible. One of my great fears, if you will, is that, is that the people that gather in the church would have some level of a mental, spiritual understanding that Jesus has died to give us life. And the people would, that's not my fear, by the way, but the people would confess that and believe that. But then, then we would go and live our lives 
like nothing matters until we get there. And, and that takes a few forms. Like one, one form is that we can just kind of live our lives however. You know, I, I said that prayer, I filled out that card, I'm going to heaven. So whatever I do doesn't matter. But, but it's not just that. Sometimes we, we think of that kind of gross abuse of grace. But it's that we go through life and we think one day we're going to turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. But until then, it's just going to be this struggle. But beloved, we have accessibility to Jesus. He's not some fat statue like Buddha. He's not some distant, far off, one day maybe we'll lay eyes on him. He is this ever-present source of help. He is available and he is accessible. And the author draws this picture and says, look, they would sacrifice, but there was no accessibility to that sacrifice. They didn't get to feast on that. They didn't get to get those those animal carcasses and to and to, you know light up the grill and have a barbecue. Those those sacrifices, the bodies went outside the camp and were burned up. And it says, remember Jesus was sacrificed outside the camp. He was outside the city. They would do executions outside of the city. And there's this picture being painted. I know that's a lot of history and stuff there. There's this picture being painted, Jesus crucified along the road outside the city. It's quite literally this picture that where he was was accessible to anyone. There was no special room, no dividing curtain, no separation. But Jesus was taken outside of the gates of the city and put on display, and the enemy thought he was winning something, and those who opposed him thought that they were putting him to shame, but he despised that shame. And as he died outside of the city, it's this symbolic picture of the reality that his death paints the picture that he is always accessible. He is not in some unreachable place where only some select few, some certain day a year, have the ability to call upon his name but that anyone who calls upon his name will be saved. And that once we're saved, see, it's not just that we call upon his name and we get saved, it's that once we're saved, practicing that salvation is remembering what we have in the accessibility of Jesus. And then verses 15 through 19, I think show us the last part. We wanna sustain our lives like Jesus is better. We remember, we understand, right? I mean, these are deep points, I know, right? But then this last point is, is our lifestyle. Our lifestyle will reflect if Jesus is better. We have to make conscious decisions in our lives to reflect the goodness of God in us. I think some ways that we do that, again, just based on the text here, is, is how we worship. Again, verse 15 says, Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. That's what we do here, but this isn't the only place that we do it. If you, if you want to say Jesus is better and you want to evaluate that against your life, I'm just asking, does your life reflect a life of worship? Does your lifestyle display the practice of worship, the, the offering of praise from your lips? Do you speak of his goodness throughout the day? Worshiping Jesus is the first priority of living. We all could stand to be a little bit more like Mary. Remember the story of Mary and Martha? There's a a contrast page that's found in the book of Luke. The contrast in in Mark chapter 14 with a woman who spills the expensive perfume on, uh, not spills, but pours expensive perfume to anoint Jesus. If you don't know the story, Mary and Martha, there's a story where, where Jesus goes to this home and this woman, Mary, she sits at his feet. It would have been by the way, culturally just astounding that he would have allowed that to begin with, the woman to be at his feet. But she sits there, and, and Martha, she's busy. You know, she's getting stuff done. I mean, man, Jesus just showed up. You know, it, it's when someone comes over unexpected, right? You know, and you weren't anticipating it, and they're like, oh, dishes are everywhere. Yeah, you know, you do the divide and conquer, right? Christy answers the door like, oh, hey, didn't know you are coming over, James. So glad you came. And I'm standing in the back like, James? So I run into the kitchen, I'm, and she's stalling them in the entryway, and I'm putting dishes in the dishwasher, you know. It's like, we don't want anyone to know that where our house is ever dirty. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? You know, it's like, 
no one lives that way. I mean, no, no, not me. No one with kids, at least. I mean, <laughs> talk about a. I know, I'm just, I'm just off notes now. Talk about an exercise in futility. Cleaning the house with four kids is an exercise in futility. But, but anyway, you know what I mean? Someone shows up on, like when they're coming over, you know, and we put all that stress. I, I got to go. This is, this is how bad we are. This is how, what do we do? Like some of us, songs, right? Everyone, maybe we get the blessing to have someone, you know, come over and going to help us out and they're going to clean the house. What do we do before they get there? Clean, clean the house. <laughs> There's a sermon in there. But anyways. But we do. Someone, someone shows up, and we've, we, we're just busy. That's Martha. Jesus shows up, and Martha's like, man, i got to put the dishes away. I gotta, I, and she's doing important things, by the way. And, and in the end, it's a short little story, and, and she's like, Jesus, are you going to say anything to Mary? I could use some help. And I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus says to Martha, Mary is, Mary, Mary's doing what's of first priority right now. Beloved, don't ever get caught up in a life that you feel like doing for Jesus trumps your being with Jesus. There is a critical role of what we do for Jesus. But if it is not the overflow of the time spent with Jesus, it is empty. Our lifestyle should reflect worship. I'll just say it. Our lives should have the marked presence of Jesus on them. There should be something different in the way we conduct ourselves, and that comes from a lifestyle of worship. However, the lifestyle of worship, check this out, there is a balance with the work we do for the Lord. This one doesn't get said enough. Poor Martha gets thrown under the bus in every sermon, right? Don't be a Martha. Every Mary needs a more. There is a balance. There comes a point in time where we do actually need to do some things for the Lord. Not because if we don't do them, he can't go on, but because he has chosen to use us. Never get confused. Never, it's not that God can't do it without us. It's that he allows us to be a part of what he's doing. And so the person in our workplace who doesn't know Jesus and their life is on a trajectory apart from him, the, the family members that, that, that are struggling and we have the capacity to help financially, the, 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 the ministries in the church that need more people to volunteer, fill in the blank. But somewhere along the way, if we say that we are lifestyle worshipers, but nowhere in our life do we display a work for the Lord then our lifestyle doesn't actually match up with Jesus is better. It's, it's, it's this combination. It's not either or. We live a lifestyle of worship, being with Jesus, spending time with him, valuing the corporate worship that we do on Sundays, having time in the word throughout the week, spending time in prayer, but then also taking all of that being with Jesus and let it fuel what we're going to do. To, 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 to believe Jesus is better is not to have worship and work be mutually exclusive in some way of what God has done in our lives. And then we have this interesting transition, I think, also that plays to our lifestyle as this passage close out, closes out in verse 16. Don't neglect what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such, with such sacrifices. Obey your leaders and submit to them since they... Keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience, wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything. And I urge you all the more to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. If Jesus is better, and we're going to sustain that in our lives, we're going to remember Jesus, we're going to remember those that have gone before us in the faith and look for encouragement in their example, we are going to understand, we're going to understand that Jesus is all we need. We're going to understand that Jesus is always available. We are going to, to apply that in the, in the way we worship and in the way we work. And then in this lifestyle, here's this last section here that I'll just be real candid. It's challenging peace to preach, right? And if you want to believe Jesus is better, then listen to me, right? I understand that it's a challenging peace to preach, but here is this part of the lifestyle that is addressed by the author. 
And it comes to spiritual leaders, and the, 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 the author of Hebrews calls us to submit and to respect. Now, this is challenging. Is this blanket, you know, no matter what? I'm not, I don't think that's what it is. But what I think is being, is, is being approached here is that when God, God empowers and entrusts some, some people uh, throughout, throughout the course of history to serve the church and to serve the kingdom, then there's this call to be mindful of what they've been called to do. And it's not this blanket, well, no matter what, I'm, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and go along with whatever. It's not that. But, but I do believe that, it's, that if we're going to err, let's err like Jesus with more grace. And the lifestyle of believing Jesus is better. There's this component that in the way we conduct ourselves, in particular in relation to those that God has, has called to specific purposes for specific seasons... There's this, this calling we have, and, and part of it is obviously this submission, but I don't want to just camp out there. It's this call to be people of prayer. And that's, that's not some flippant call, by the way. And by the way, if you think about it, go ahead and pray for those that are leading. I mean, think about the people that received this letter in a time of persecution. The church most likely gathered in a home, as most New Testament churches did. Maybe they did so in secret. We don't have all the details. But think of those that were hosting and leading this body of believers. And the author says, look, there's some things that are going on. And, 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 and understand what they've been called to. Submit yourself to that. But, but pray for them. Pray for them. Not, not, not this casual, oh, you know, I'll pray for you and then I'll forget about it later. But this call the author gives to pray out of submission and respect for those that God has placed among their midst. Beloved, Jesus is better. Amen? amen. 41 weeks. You better amen that one. Jesus is better. We, we know it to be true. We also know that in this life, we will face seasons of discouragement. We know that in this life, we will go through trials of various kinds. And those two realities don't cancel the other out. Because Jesus is better doesn't mean we're not going to have difficult days. And because we have difficult days doesn't mean that Jesus is not better. Jesus is better. We know this to be true. And yes, we will deal with discouragement and we will face difficult days. What's the answer? The answer is not to be tossed in the wind, but to stand firm and to sustain in our lives that Jesus is better, that who he is and what he has given me is enough. And that when everything seems to be going according to plan, I will sing his praises. And when everything seems to just be raking me over the coals and pulling me from the inside out apart, I will still believe that Jesus is better. Because as the text says, we, will, we, we, we worship now, we work now, but it is not some passing city that Jesus has built for us. The, the, the weight of the beauty of Hebrews is that we have hope and we have hurt today, but there is a day and it is not this city, it is the home he has established in heaven for me. And when I get there, all the things that keep me up at night and all the struggles and all the things that, that seek to trip me up and all the temptations, they will be left behind. And that is true. Why? Because Jesus is better. He is better. And so we cling to that today. We sustain, we stay faithful, and we stay fruitful. And how do we do that? How do we do that? <clears throat> Let me give you a few things to think about. Maybe some of us today, very, very simply, your next step is going to be to, to remember a little bit better. Maybe some of us need to leave here today and, and we need to write down the names of people that have gone before us. Maybe we need to call some people that are a little further down the road from than we are and get that encouragement. Let us never think that we are alone. That's a lie. Let us never think that we have to do it on our own. That's a lie. And let us never think that we can do it on our own. 
I don't have time. I've shared throughout this series in a sermon. And if you missed it, I'll just share with you that there was a season in my life when, when I thought of my, my mom's father, who was a pastor, I didn't think of it with great admiration because of some decisions that he had made in his life that resulted in him not serving in ministry later on. In fact, when I thought, I never, I never met him. He died the year I was born. But when I thought, all I thought is, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And I pray that's still true. <laughs> that I won't make the decisions that he, that he made. But what God has done in my heart in the last several years is he's reminded me that my grandfather may have made some decisions that were not good, but that's not who he was. Because he had been purchased by Jesus. And so now I don't think about, oh, how I don't want to be that way. I think about how God was so gracious to my family to allow my grandfather and my great-grandfather and my great-grand, my great-great-grandfather to serve as pastors in a church, and now he's letting me do that as well. So we remember. Maybe some of us, we just need to go write some stuff down. Maybe we need to remember how good Jesus is. Are, are you remembering Jesus? You say, well, how do I do that? Well, it's not just some cliche. Do, do you have any time in your week that you connect with him in the word? And I give the same examples, like, well, I just don't know how to do that. Then read the first psalm tonight. The first, it's take you like 25 seconds, I think. Just read the first psalm. And then just write down one comment. Oh, I don't write down. Well, get over it, all right? <laughs> write down one thing that kind of stuck out. Pray about that one thing. And then tomorrow... Read the second psalm. Try to read the first five in the next seven days. Read the, the first chapter of the book of Proverbs and try to do that for a month. Read, read the first chapter of Philippians this week. Start the book of Mark. Go after something. But you'll never remember the goodness of Jesus and how he's better if you don't connect with him. Maybe some of us aren't living like Jesus is better because our understanding is not what it should be. I think there are some of us that we've received Jesus and we know that we're saved, we know we're going to heaven, but we just think we're not any good until we get there. Well, I can't serve at the church. Or I can't, you know, I, I don't need to speak up at work. I don't need to tell people about Jesus because those people I work with, they know how I used to live. Beloved, I am so thankful that God is not as quick to write us off as we are. <laughs> let me just say, let, let us be in the world of social media and instant news. Let us be so careful not to be quicker, harsher judges than Jesus. But if he saved you, he intends to use you. Are you asking them where that's going to be? Does your, does your understanding need to get shifted today? God, God has called you. Are you letting sin run rampant in your life? Well, then, of course, you're not going to feel usable because you're walking in darkness, but you can repent and walk in light again. If you're struggling with sin, get it in the light. It is painful, but it is necessary. Change your understanding. Does your life reflect Jesus is better both in worship and work? Have you trusted Jesus, right? You've called upon his name. You've received salvation, but you have yet to be obedient with baptism. That step of obedience is another way you proclaim that Jesus is better, and you acknowledge that in your worship. Do you need to become more committed to the gathering of the saints through worship like we are doing today? Are you serving the body of Christ? Are you sharing the good news of Jesus? Are there areas where your worship and work need to more accurately reflect that Jesus is better? In light of verses 16 through 19, what I see there are three things that I think we should all evaluate in our lives. At the end of this passage, we are, we are called to be a people who are actively generous. That's what verse 16 tells us. Are you actively generous with your time, your resources? We're called to be joy joyfully submissive. And we're called to be constantly prayerful.
And the context of those verses deals with spiritual leaders, but it's so much bigger than that. Maybe you just need to ask yourself today, does your life reflect active generosity, joyful submission, and constant prayer? And here's the last thing. I want to ask our ministers to go ahead and start coming forward. And these men and women are going to be available to pray with you today if you want someone to pray about a situation that you're dealing with, to speak some life into you. But, but let me ask you this. Whether you've been here all 41 weeks or this is the first time you have ever visited this church. Do you know today that you know Jesus? See, the first step of a life that believes and lives that Jesus is better is a life that has received Jesus. Not connected to your religious duty, not not connected to your performance for, for God, not connected to your history and legacy and family tradition of faith, but in your own life. Have you had that moment where you've recognized that you need a savior? Have you had that moment where you knew that there was nothing you could do, right? The, the funny thing about receiving Jesus is that it becomes our lowest moment, right? It's that I can't do it. My pride doesn't like it. I can't do it. I, I'm, I'm never going to be good enough. I am utterly hopeless. But the beauty of Jesus is that when we reach our lowest, we're at our best because that's when we call upon the name of Jesus and receive salvation. If you don't know that you know Jesus, today needs to be that day. Today needs to be the day that you call upon the name of Jesus and you receive the gift of salvation. It is not what you do. It's what Jesus has done, and he is ready and willing to give that to you. You just you need to come forward during this time. It's not about walking an aisle and talking to a minister. But what it's about is that right now you have the opportunity. I'm going to pray that that's what you need to do, that you would be willing to do so. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to worship together. We're going to sing. And as the Lord reveals things in your heart, if you need prayer, I want you to come forward and share with these men and women what they can pray for you about. If you have some things you need to get off your chest, some things you need to confess, you can do that. But ultimately, if you need to know Jesus, this is your chance to come forward and to say, I need to know Jesus. Could you tell me what that looks like? Father, this time is yours. I pray that you would move among us. I pray that you would speak to us. And God, I pray today that in this moment of response, you would be glorified. It's in Jesus' name.